Logistic regression models in scikit-learn follow the same pattern that the linear regression models followed earlier. That is, we define an instance of a logistic regression model, fit it, and then use it to make predictions. So I'm going to walk through how to do that now. So the first step is to import the logistic regression class from the linear model package in scikit-learn. It's actually interesting that logistic regression is in the linear model package in scikit-learn. The reason for this is that the linear model package in scikit-learn actually contains a large class of generalized linear models, not just the traditional least squares linear regression model. So we'll import the logistic regression class, and then we can create an instance of the logistic regression model doing the following. It's worth noting that you can choose the solver that you use. Uh, by default, in the latest version of scikit-learn, it will use LBFGS. There are other options you can set as well, such as the L2 regularization penalty, penalty and I'll come back to that in a moment, uh, tolerance, uh, whether I fit intercept, some of the standard stuff we'd seen before when doing least squares regression. So we've created an instance of our model here, and now we can fit it. And that's it. So it was actually much faster. The LBFGS solvers are quite a bit more efficient, and so we're able to get a fit model for our data. We can actually take a look at this model. Let's do that here. Um, so LR model. Dot coef. There we go. So our coefficient, uh, and we can also look at the intercept for this model. So there you go. So those are the coefficients and intercepts. Um, if we scroll back up to what we computed using PyTorch, uh, somewhat closer, you know, somewhat close. So negative 16.4 and 1.04, and we see down here uh, 0 0.97 and negative 14. So slightly different. Um, actually, that's going to really be due to the regularization factor, which we'll come back to in a moment. All right, so to make predictions, uh, it's just as before. Uh, once you've trained the model, you can make predictions by calling the predict function. But there's one minor catch. Uh, so if I make pr a prediction by passing in a, a diameter of a, um, or the mean radius of a, of a tumor as 12, uh, it's actually going to return a 0. And if I say, let's say, uh, 20, that returns a 1. So the the thing that's predicted is not the probability, but the the class of the of the tumor, so whether or not it's benign or malignant. If we wanted the probability, we use the predict uh, prob a or probability function. Um, and here when we pass in 12, it returns the probability of it being benign and the probability of it being malignant. So it returns the two probabilities. Now the reason it returns two probabilities is it is actually possible to use this model in settings where you have more than one class. And there's an extension of logistic regression to the multi-class setting. All right, so we can now plot this model. Let's do that here. So we've plotted the model. And we can compare against our PyTorch model. And we see that the scikit-learn uh, logistic regression model and the, the PyTorch model are fairly similar. So the PyTorch model uh, is a little bit shifted uh, to the right. Now the reason there's a difference between the two models is that scikit-learn has actually added an extra regularization term to address an issue that I'll talk about in a moment. And so if you recall earlier, the parameter values that we got from scikit-learn were a little bit smaller than the parameter values, so 0.97 and negative 14.4 uh, is are, are smaller than the, the, the PyTorch values, which were uh, negative 16 and 1.04. Right, so there's a little bit of extra regularization in scikit-learn, and so we got slightly different predictions. So why do we have an additional regularization factor in the scikit-learn model? Well, this is because the logistic regression model has a, a particular pathology or anomaly that, that occurs when our data is linearly separable. So to illustrate that, I'm going to make a toy data set. I'll plot it here. This is my toy data. Uh, and so I have four data points. Two are uh, zero, so the, a, the y value is zero, at negative one and at point, negative point two, and then two are positive at point two and one. So we call this data linearly separable because there is a, a logistic regression model that, that can predict this, this data perfectly. That is, there's a, a, a vertical line here that we could place on, on this axis that would separate the left side, which contains only things that are zero, from the right side that contains only things that are one. Note if I had added an extra data point down here, this data would no longer be linearly separable since I couldn't place a split on my x-axis that separates the zeros from the ones. So this is linearly separable data. 
And if I take my logistic regression model and, and simplify it further, so I'm just going to consider a model that looks like this. So I've dropped the, the intercept term, and I just have this slope term. So I define the model here. And so then below, we've also defined the cross entropy, not in PyTorch, but in NumPy. So now what I can do is try a range of different values for theta. So I'm going to try theta going from 1 uh, up to 100. So that's my, my slope term. And what I've plotted here on the y-axis is the cross entropy of the loss. And on the x-axis is the different values for my theta. So just empirically trying different values for theta for this toy data set of four data points. And what you notice is that I can keep getting, I can keep reducing my cross entropy loss by making my theta value progressively larger. Uh, and what does that correspond to? So we can do is we can plot the, the sequence of logistic regression uh, probability models, our, our, our curves, our sigmoid, as we increase the value of theta. And you see what happens is as we make theta larger, this slope gets steeper and steeper, which makes the, the curve here closer and closer to zero, and the curve here closer and closer to one, which increases the fit of our data until we'd end up with a, a step function that's, that's uh, almost perfectly zero, and then it would jump up to almost perfectly one. And that's when our, our theta value diverges to infinity. And so what we'd like is some form of regularization to prevent this from happening. And we want that for a couple of reasons. First, for numerical reasons, we don't want the optimization procedure to diverge. Uh, and second, maybe more importantly, is that we don't really want this to go all the way to zero and this to go all the way to one because that's essentially saying that we're absolutely certain that the data points here up to this point right here are, are going to be malignant. And as soon as we cut across this, this threshold, then they're going to become benign. Um, and, and that's not how we imagine the world works since we want to be able to have some uncertainty uh, between these two points so at our decision boundary. Therefore, it's not uncommon to have a, at least some form of regularization and typically an L2 regularization for our loss. So we can add a regularization term and we've taken our cross entropy loss from earlier and we've added an extra uh, uh, one to the negative or one times 10 to the negative five times theta one squared. So an extra L2 regularization on our theta and then we can plot this loss as a function of different theta values. And you see that as theta gets larger and larger, the, the loss, the regularization term starts to dominate. And so we don't increase the value of theta 1 beyond a certain threshold. All right, so that's the basics of using uh, logistic regression in scikit-learn. I also touched on some of the issues around linearly separable data and why we need regularization. And now what is left to cover, and what I'll add to the notebook below uh, here, is a, a short discussion on precision and recall, and, and how that relates to the classification rule, or, or decision rule, that we'll use to translate this probability of 0.97 malignant, for example, and convert that to a decision whether or not we're going to define that particular tumor as uh, malignant or benign.